Hello, my name is Angelina Davidova. I come from St. Petersburg, Russia, and I'm one of the Humphrey Fellows at UC Davis in 2018-2019 program. Let me tell you a few words about what Humphrey program is and why I'm here. I'm here in a wonderful cohort of 12 other Humphrey Fellows from all across the globe. And uh, we are come as a team of young mid-career professionals who arrived to the United States and spent a year here learning about environmental policy, climate policy, environmental actions, attending courses at UC Davis, giving public presentations, engaging with local community, talking with students, talking with professors, and overall learning about life in California and the United States in general. The Humphrey program brings every year around 130 young mid-career professionals from all across the, the globe to the United States, and they're being distributed across 12 campuses. So UC Davis is one of the receiving campuses of the program. Here you can see a picture of us. We've just arrived to UC Davis in August last year. Uh, we're all very happy. We don't know what awaits us. And uh, the next few months turned out to be really exciting, really interesting, and really useful. Quite a lot of the people from the program have left already, uh, but there are a few remaining. And um, uh, four of the Humphrey Fellows, uh, including myself, took part in a public event on uh, May 5th, organized by the Cool Davis Association. And uh, the main mission of the event was to speak about um, climate change consequences in our countries and in our regions of the world. So what kind of negative impacts of climate change are being observed? What is happening? Um, why is it dangerous? What is being done? Are there any kind of adaptation strategies in the countries we come from? Uh, on the other hand, we were also encouraged to speak about uh, mitigation policies. That is what our regions of the world are doing with regard to bringing emissions down of greenhouse gases. Uh, the Humphrey program at UC Davis is run by the Global Affairs. And uh, here you can see um, information about what Global Affairs at UC Davis are and what is it that they are doing. Their main mission is to encourage international cooperation of UC Davis with other academic institutions all across the world, but not only academic institutions, as our program is a non-academic and a non-degree one. Um, here's some more information about the Hubert H. Humphrey Fellowship Program. And um, as you can see here, uh, this year uh, marks 40th anniversary of the program. So it looks like our program and our year was indeed very special. And it proved out to be like that. So climate change, climate change in Russia, what consequences do we have? What is happening in our part of the world? That would be the topic of my talk over the next few minutes. And uh, I'm going to show you a few maps. I'm going to show you a few pictures. I'm going to show you a few graphs. And I'm going to tell you a few stories about climate change and Russia. Um, climate change used to be a very difficult topic for Russia. I started covering climate change. And I have to tell you that I'm in, back at home. I'm an environmental journalist. And I write for Russian international media about climate change, climate policies, global climate agenda, local climate agenda, United Nations negotiations, climate negotiations, in which I've been taking part over the last 10 years. So in Russia, climate change has been somewhat of a complicated topic. When I started writing about it 10 years ago, that topic was not considered to be a serious one. It was somewhat of a marginal topic. People would pay very little attention to, and people would not consider to be serious. So there were all these jokes about how climate change is beneficial for Russia, because Russia is a northern country, and um, because if we have warmer climate, that would mean uh, we might be able possibly to grow bananas in taiga, or we won't need our fur coats in winter when it's so cold. However, as years go by, and um, the results of the work of people like myself and other people who are trying to promote climate agenda and bringing the latest scientific climate data to the general public in Russia. So the results of our work are finally bringing fruits. And we see more and more climate awareness um, across the country. 
among general public, among politicians, among business people. People are interested in the topic, people are willing to learn more, people are willing to do more, people keep asking questions, what is it that we can do? So this first slide which I wanted to show you um, demonstrates um, climate change um, in the territory of Russia, the projected climate change uh, in the 21st century. And um, as you can see here, uh, some parts of the country will become much warmer than they used to be. This is this middle part of the country, you know, the middle of Siberia is probably going to get very warm. Um, in fact, um, a couple of years ago, during the United Nations climate negotiations in um, November 2017, um, a latest uh, World Meteorological Organization report has been presented, which over made an overview of the rising temperatures all across the globe. And interestingly, if we look up at historic perspective, the highest temperature rise we observe in the world was actually found here in this part of Russia. So since 1970s, average mean temperatures have increased by approximately 7 degrees Celsius, which is absolute maximum for the world. What does it mean for Russia, and not only for Russia, for the whole of the world, the fact that temperatures are rising up here? One can argue there are very few people living in this part of Russia. Most of Russia's population is living around here or maybe down the southern border of Siberia. However, here you would have very little people living. Um, we don't have that many people there. However, what we do have there is permafrost. And the permafrost is frozen earth, which sometimes melts down in summer, but sometimes doesn't. It depends on where you find yourself. Uh, climate change means more larger and larger areas of permafrost melting and releasing both methane and CO2 as a result of this process, which provides a positive feedback effect, bringing climate change even worse and making it even more, even stronger, thus increasing the temperatures and as a consequence, bringing even to more permafrost melting. So it's one of the very negative consequences of climate change which is taking place in Russia right now and which has very negative consequences not only for Russia but also for the whole of the world. Unfortunately that process is taking place. Scientists do not really know what we can do about it at the moment. It's one of these loop effects where one factor causes another one and then influences back the first factor which is as I said earlier and I'll repeat it now Increasing temperatures, uh, permafrost melting, more greenhouse gases being released into atmosphere, climate change wars, and you know we're back into the circle. Um, on this slide, you also see um, observed uh, increasing temperatures all across Russia over the 20th century. So the last slide we saw that was about the future. Now, this one was about the past, and uh, this is also about particular seasons like winter, spring, summer, and autumn. Um, so what is happening in various parts of the country? And here, once again, you see the redder it is, the hotter it got, but then some parts of the country also got a bit colder. And um, I think this is also a very important argument whenever we speak about global climate change, is that um, global climate change doesn't equal global warming. Um, in some parts of the world, it will become hotter, much hotter. In other parts of the world, it will become colder. In some parts of the world, we might experience droughts and severe droughts. In other parts of the world, floods. So it's all about disbalances. It's all about climatic systems and other ecosystems of the planet coming out of what, of how we know they are, coming out of balance and um, making a complete chaos of the way we used to know them and thus making life of people and uh, future of ecosystems um, very unpredictable, uh, putting a lot of risks to economic and social activities and to lives and to the health of people on the planet. 
Um, another very important consequence of climate change for Russia is the increasing number of dangerous and unpredicted and meteorological or weather phenomena. That can be storms, very strong winds, um, waves of cold in winter, waves of heat in summer in the regions which are not used to it, floods, droughts. As you see, their number is increasing, steadily increasing. Um, we have data here on this graph from 1996. However, if we were to have this data from 1970, we would see that the total number of uh, these dangerous and hazardous hydrometeorological events have increased twice since the 70s. So even such a cold country as Russia is experiencing a number of dangerous events taking place all across the country and bringing in economic damages, bringing in more risks for ecosystems, for people, for cities, for economy, for environment. And this is obviously a very important factor, something which needs to be taken care of. Um, I've already mentioned um, the permafrost problem and um, I gave a brief explanation. Um, why is it such an important problem? And uh, why is it the melting permafrost poses a global threat? And uh, here's one more picture when we look up not at Russia at the moment, but at an Arctic. And we see, we kind of look at the Arctic from, from, from above, from the where the North Pole is. So this is where we can see Canada, um, uh, Greenland, Iceland, uh, China is here, Russia is here, Sweden is here. And um, you can also see how um, rapidly uh, temperatures have been increasing in the Arctic region over the last few years and this is also what the latest scientific data tells us and also how sea ice is diminishing in the region um, and keeps thawing uh, faster and faster. Um, a few last summers we did not have um, much ice in the Russian Arctic. In fact, um, throughout the whole history of scientific observations, the last two summers had the least ice cover in the Arctic region, uh, adjacent to Russia, uh, to, yeah, throughout the whole history, which one can argue has both positive and negative effects. So the positive effect is that uh, now that passage will be open for marine transportation and there are a few commercial uh, ships which already went that way, bringing goods from here, from here to here. But then on the other hand, as well with thawing permafrost, melting Arctic, melting ice in the Arctic poses quite a few global threats. Uh, changes global climate, changes pattern of rains in many regions across the world, changes pattern of winds, changes patterns of cold, brings it a lot of cold into North America in winter, which you probably have heard of the Arctic vortex. And the Arctic vortex has been getting more and more severe over the last few years. But on the other hand, also changing everything we know about how um, atmospheric currents move, how winds come, how rains come. So what we are to see over the next few years is a completely new picture of the rains, of, of the winds, of many other weather patterns to what we are not used to and of which we might not still know all the consequences. Now, this is another picture which shows the, uh, the effect of the thawing permafrost and those are the craters which keep appearing all across eastern part of Russia. Uh, these craters are pretty deep and they appear as a result of melting permafrost. So the way it happens is that permafrost doesn't melt gradually. In fact, for a while an upper crust still remains, while underneath it you might have um, large cavities um, appearing. And after a while the upper crust tumbles down and you'll get a crater like this. So this crater was found um, a few years ago, even though it began to sink since the 60s. 
Uh, it is located in the Yakutia region of Russia. I'll just show you on a map where it is. So it's around here. And as I mentioned, there are quite a number of these craters appearing in the eastern part of the country. And this is once again a very worrisome phenomenon, which scientists, including an international group of scientists, are currently studying. Now, um, if we look up at this latest IPCC report, and IPCC is the International Panel, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is a group of thousands of um, scientists who get together and overview the latest data on scientific research on climate change all across the globe. So their latest report, which was called 1.5 degrees Celsius, and that is the target which we hope the world could aim for, um, not allowing the planet to go any hotter than the 1.5 degrees Celsius. So this latest report, which came out last fall, had this data available. And that is, um, it shows us what happens with Arctic sea ice, what happens with permafrost, and what happens with glaciers if global temperatures go 1.5 degrees Celsius, 2 degrees Celsius, and 3 degrees Celsius. And here you can see the number of, um, the percentage of Arctic sea ice melting in all these three scenarios. Likewise, the uh, total square of permafrost melting, and likewise the areas of glaciers which the world will lose if global temperatures raise up like this and go up by 1.5, 2 or 3 degrees Celsius. So this is the data we have now, and uh, this once again would mean a very different world, a world with far less glaciers, a world with far less permafrost, and a world with far less Arctic ice, which as I pointed out earlier, will have very long-running uh, systematic um, consequences for many other ecosystems all across the globe. Now, another very drastic and another very serious consequence of um, climate change in Russia, and this is also something which brings us close with to California, this is where I spent the last 10 months of my life, those are the wildfires. Um, you don't often hear or read about wildfires in Russia these days. However, in um, mostly in eastern part of the country, this is where the forests are drier than the ones in the western part of the country. There are quite a number of forest fires and their intensity and their total square and the areas keep increasing from year to year. And this is once again another example of a very serious and complex uh, consequence of climate change, which proves to be a um, feedback loop connection, meaning the warmer it gets, the drier forests become. The drier they become, uh, the more vulnerable they are to parasites and various kinds of insects and diseases. Uh, more wildfires are to take place in these forests. Uh, wildfires meaning more greenhouse gases being released into atmosphere, which in turn makes climate change even worse and brings back original effect on forest fires. So this is what we observe here in California. This is what we also see in Russia. Uh, this is a um, picture over and a map over of a real time um, satellite data on the current wildfires in uh, mid-May, so 2019, and you can see uh, where the fires are and how intensive they are. Uh, and these are um, a few further photographs of uh, wildfires in Russia from April 2019 and uh, May 2019, just to show you how they look. Um, quite a lot of wildfires in Russia take place in the areas which are either completely unpopulated or very densely populated. If they originate in an area which are far from any human settlements, they're usually not being put down, which also means um, huge amounts of CO2 emissions coming into atmosphere and a lot of black carbon or soot flying all the way to 
Arctic and uh, causing albedo effect, which means the reflective capacity of ice and snow in the Arctic becomes less. Uh, and uh, once again, it brings um, a very negative effect, uh, both in climate change, making it even stronger and making it even severe. Uh, however, if forest fires approach any human settlements, they are obviously being fought with. Uh, they're being put down, people are being evacuated. Um, so the situation is pretty much the same as well as the one in California with the wildfires here. Um, this is another picture from summer 2010. Uh, that was the only time in recent history of Russia when forest fires um, got as close as almost around Moscow. And uh, that made uh, big news, including international news. So Moscow was in smoke for around a week. And it has been estimated that the smoke has caused around 11,000 extra deaths meaning people who have been ill or elderly um, have died earlier because of the effects of the smoke. And um, that smoke, once again, um, was very similar to what we experienced here in California. Um, in my own experience, the campfire last November, when uh, both Davis and Sacramento were covered in smoke and people were wearing masks and people were trying to work out how to live in these conditions. So that was one of the few cases when Moscow experienced very similar effect of climate change. Uh, what was burning around Moscow, it were not only forests, so it were not only forest fires, those were also peat fires. Because during the latest years of the Soviet Union, quite a few peats, peatlands have been dried up around Moscow and they became particularly vulnerable to uh, increasing droughts and to increasing heat. And as the heat wave came and as the drought came, uh, quite a few peat fires appeared. And peat fires are the ones which are really difficult to put down because if you're trying to put them down with water, like pour pouring water on them from the helicopters, this is the way you would do, say, in trying to put down a forest fire in Russia. Um, in many cases, water just doesn't get as deep down as to the lowest level uh, of the, where the fire is actually taking place. Uh, the water evaporates. So um, a whole program of rewatering peatlands around Moscow and a few other central regions of Russia have been launched after following these fires. And um, so I can say ever since 2010, we didn't have such um, um, tragic and such intense forest or pit fires in central Russia. However, as I mentioned earlier, in eastern parts of Russia, in eastern Siberia, in the forest of Russia, the forest fires um, have been on the rise. They increase, the intensity increase, the areas increase, and this is once again a very worrisome factor, not only for Russia, but for the whole of the world. Now to um, say a few words about Russia's climate policy and to, uh, because I spoke quite a lot about uh, what are the effects of uh, climate change in Russia. Now, um, my next point is uh, what about uh, greenhouse gas emissions? What is being done in Russia? What is not being done in Russia? And um, as you can see from this graph, Russia's historic emissions, uh, they went drastically down in the 90s and 2000s, following the um, demise and demolition of the Soviet economy and uh, destruction of the industrial sector. So in a way, following the fallout of the Soviet Union, a lot of industry has collapsed, which led to a completely new structure of the economy. So today's structure of Russian economy is a lot about extracting industries, a lot about oil and gas industries and other fossil fuels, uh, a lot about service industries, a lot about construction or services or other uh, service sectors, but not so much industrial sector, not so much production sector like we see in today's China or other new industrial giant countries. 
which led to the fact that uh, countries' emissions went down significantly. We are now around uh, something around below 30 percent uh, lower in our emissions of greenhouse gases in comparison to 1990, which means Russia, which ratified and was a party to the Kyoto Protocol, has overfulfilled its Kyoto Protocol target, and uh, but it didn't do much. In fact, it only happened mainly because of the collapse of the economy. It should be noted that that particular process didn't only take part in Russia, it also took part in uh, many other countries across Eastern Europe, uh, countries whose economy changed completely following the uh, transformation from the communist economy or the post-communist economy into the market economy. So you would get the same picture in all former Soviet Union republics, in many countries of Eastern Europe, even in Eastern Germany. So you'd have a similar picture. Now you can also see from this graph, uh, the majority of Russia's emissions are coming from the energy sector, um, meaning use and burning down of fossil fuels for production of electricity or heating. If here in California, um, conditioning is a huge issue, like on a hot day like this one, then back in Russia, heating is a very big issue and uh, it's something for which we need a lot of energy and a lot of uh, fossil fuels needs to be burned down to keep the houses warm in winter when it gets very cold. Um, so right, so here's another graph showing us the historic emission of Russia. Uh, Russia still has not ratified the Paris Agreement. It is about to do so uh, this year, hopefully. Uh, Russia has its target under the Paris Agreement which says it aims to bring its emissions down by 25 to 30 percent by 2030 uh, with relation to 1990, uh, which however means uh, it will not do much in reducing emissions any further down from the current level, because as we heard, the current level of Russia's emissions is around minus 30 percent already. So it means their emissions will either stay at this level or might even grow a bit. Um, but then, Russia doesn't have growing population and uh, most of the prospects also do not predict that there will be more people living in Russia. In fact, most UN scenarios predict diminishing population in Russia. Uh, the economic prospects are also um, sometimes very unclear, like how the economy will behave over the next 10 or 20 years. So overall, current scenarios do not show very drastic growth in Russia's emissions. However, even with that being taken into consideration, Russia is still fifth largest uh, world emitter of greenhouse gases, following China, the US, uh, European Union, and India. And uh, it is still a very important uh, player and, and it plays a crucial role in the global climate agenda. And um, this is why it's super important to bring Russia to international discussions and international cooperation in the area of climate change. And this is what people like myself have been trying to do, both raising up climate awareness through the articles which I write for Russian international media, but also trying to facilitate and um, make come to life various international cooperation projects between Russia and other countries or regions of the world in the area of climate cooperation. Thank you for your attention. Um, I hope this presentation was useful and um, interesting for you. And I'm open to any questions which are out there in the audience. Thank you. Thanks, Angelina. What a lot of information. Thank you. That was very helpful. Um, so obviously you are really well informed and probably you're not the typical Russian resident. So how, how informed are most people in Russia about climate change? Um, thank you for your question. Um, most of Russians are aware of climate change and according to latest polls which have been carried out across all of the countries. Um, quite a lot of people in Russia are aware of this problem. 
Uh, some of them also believe it is a serious threat to Russia and the number of these people continue to rise. However, a very tiny uh, proportion of people is worried with um, climate change to the extent that they are really willing to take uh, any serious changes in their life and their lifestyles and actually do something. Um, it should be noted that environmental awareness has been really on the rise in Russia over the few last years. And this is something which I've been observing uh, in my work and in my activity and uh, while talking to people, while seeing what happens all across the country. Uh, however, most environmental problems which people are worried about are very local or hyper-local environmental problems. Those would be waste management, uh, issues of recycling, um, air pollution, information about air quality, information about water quality, anything to do with green areas in cities, urban development, sustainable urban development. More and more people in Russia are moving from rural areas to urban areas. So cities are growing. There's a lot of construction taking place. Uh, so uh, any questions relating to trees, to green zones, to parks, all these are very burning issues. And people easily get organized in movements to support these issues, to fight for these issues. There are a lot of grassroots environmental movements. Uh, however, most of them are fighting and uh, for very local or hyper-local causes and don't deal that much with climate change agenda as I see in other regions of the world. However, as I mentioned, the situation is changing. The awareness is very slowly, but it's growing. So let's see what happens over the next few years. I was really interested that your presentation pointed out so clearly in a geographically varied uh, region like Russia that while climate change has undeni undeniable negative effects, there are also what could be perceived as positive outcomes. And is this a complicating factor in making policy decisions? Has it come into play in, in coming up with a climate policy for the country? Yes, thank you for your question. It is indeed so. It is indeed um, a complicating factor uh, because whenever there are um, analysis or climate reports coming out in Russia, like climate change assessment reports, which regularly appear in Russia, they obviously bring in and they obviously state all these negative effects of climate change, which I mentioned in my presentation, but they also do bring up some positive effects, including warmer climate, which means we will need less money and less energy for heating, more uh, chances for marine transportation across the northern border of Russia in the Arctic Ocean, and possibly better conditions for agriculture in the south of Russia. So yeah, there are both positive and negative effects. But then, as um, Russian scientists often say, um, positive effects come easy, and uh, um, we don't need to do anything to, for them. However, negative effects often come unexpected, and uh, uh, we should be prepared, and we should really think about adaptation, and we should really think about diminishing climate risks. But yes, you're right. It's after all, it's both positive and negative effects of climate change that we're speaking about. Another very complicated factor in Russia, which also makes it not very easy to push climate agenda forward, is the fact that Russia's economy is deeply um, uh, connected with oil and gas sector and fossil fuel sector, meaning extraction of oil, gas and coal and selling it to other countries. And indeed, with these sectors being seen as the basis for Russia's economy, bringing in low carbon agenda or decarbonization agenda is once again, is not a very easy task. However, there's a group of um, ambitious climate activists, which you find um, in many uh, regions across Russia and in many organizations across Russia, which are trying to bring this issue forward, which is trying to say, uh, look, it's not only about us, it's also about what the whole world is doing, where the world is going to. If there will be less demand for fossil fuel in future, what are we going to do? So there are also all these talks about how global decarbonization influences Russia's economy and prospects of Russia's economy, and how we should possibly restructure Russia's economy and start developing other sectors and not only fossil fuel sector. 
Hmm. Does the government have um, programs trying to encourage people to use less fossil fuels at all? Are, are there such programs or? Um, well, there is a, uh, a number of laws like legislation on energy efficiency, which encourages people and organizations and institutions to become more energy efficient and to save energy. Mm -hmm. uh, then there's another law and um, a set of regulation which encourages the development of renewable energy, including solar and wind. Uh, that development has been very modest. Uh, the so-called new renewable energy, meaning solar and wind, still plays a very minor role in Russian energy balance, something around 1% of the total energy balance. However, what we've seen over the last few years is some modest development. So there are solar parks appearing in Russia, there are wind parks appearing in Russia. A number of large international players, including Fortum or Enel, which are like large energy companies have investment invested in Russian energy, uh, renewable energy sector. So we see this appearing, but it mostly appears not in terms of like people's private uh, houses, like communities, but mostly in terms of larger solar parks or wind parks. Uh, this also has been a new legislation coming into power, which allows people uh, to have um, um, solar panels or a wind uh, mill on um, in their private house, uh, so it and then use neat metering to calculate how much energy you produce and given to the grid, and then how much energy you get back into the grid from the grid. Um, however, that sector has been um, developing really slow because there are not that many uh, financial incentives for people to use it, uh, because traditional energy, fossil fuel energy, is still very cheap in Russia. And um, so we see very modest development of this. But then this can once again change. Um, a great sector for development of renewables in Russia, this is what many experts are saying, is the um, uh, large territories, large areas of Russia, which are located mostly around, uh, I'll just show you on the map. Oh. Mm -hmm. which are mostly located around this area, the area of the so-called decentralized energy supplies. Uh, that means since the population density is so low, you would probably have like a city here and a city here, and they would not be connected to the grid, like to the overall grid of any you know, regional grid in Russia. Um, up until recently, they would have diesel brought to these settlements by helicopters because there are no roads to get there. Uh, and um, well, using diesel and burning diesel is environmentally unsustainable. It costs a lot. And um, there have been a number of projects coming into life with trying to replace this diesel by hybrid solar diesel stations or wind diesel stations or wind and solar and diesel stations, meaning if there is sun, then there is solar energy coming. If there's wind, then there's wind energy coming. And um, if there is uh, none of that, then we'll probably use diesel. And we've seen some of these projects once again appearing in the Republic of Yakutia, which is one of the most the coldest regions of the world, but it's also one of the sunniest regions of the world. And there have been a few experiments with constructing solar parks in a very cold climate in this area of Russia. So this is possibly um, the most promising sector for developing of renewable energy, including solar and wind, for the next few years. Wow. Passive solar would work well, too, there. Like my house, um, they wouldn't even have to have solar panels, just constructing the buildings such that they capture the heat from the sunlight coming into the house would, and, and some kind of storage for it, like the tubes of water that I have, yeah. would work there, yeah. um, which would be a very inexpensive way to capture that that potential. Yep. Wow. Um, so, this yeah. is so interesting to hear this. Um, it, uh, what about activism? Y you've been here long enough to realize we're beginning to have a bit of a, perhaps we can call it a groundswell of activism in our country, where we have um, 
different groups who are starting to show up in the street saying, we must have change now. Um, and um, we have a climate student climate strike group, and of course Greta Thunberg from Sweden is leading it, but we're picking up our own leaders here in the US, and we have the um, Sunrise group who are youth, millennium, students, graduates leading that and, and other groups that are getting very active. Do you have a, 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 a growing group of activists who are saying, we can't ignore this? Um, well, there is a group of activists who are also worried about climate change. And following Greta's case, uh, we had a number of young people also in Russia coming out and showing their commitment to the global climate fight. Uh, however, as I mentioned earlier, most of campaigns, most of environmental campaigns in Russia are still uh, concentrated around local environmental topics, and that would be waste, air quality, trees issues, other green issues. So climate activism is not widely rooted, is not as widespread even as it is here, but I think we might see more of that coming in the future. Sort of in a, a similar but a little more negative vein. Um, here we have a block of people, some with great power, that are essentially climate deniers, so so called, mm -hmm. um, that refuse to acknowledge the the importance of the scientific data and and the um, outcomes that are being predicted. Um, is that also a problem in Russia, um, or are people in general? Um, receptive to the science and um, are, are just beginning to be aware of the implications? Well, I think it's a problem everywhere in the world. So also in Russia we do have climate denialists also among some of the scientists and also among representatives of some of the companies which are also willing to pay for the research and are interested in research which brings them particular results with, uh, which mm -hmm. you know, support climate denialism. Overall, I would say in general population, um, climate denialism is not that present, but within professional community, you sometimes have people, you have politicians, you have scientists coming up and saying that the whole climate change, that's, that's a scam, or that's a global conspiracy, or you know something like this. So you have them, but I would say you probably have them almost all around the world. But in my opinion, like the overall general trend is that there is less climate denialism now than it used to be and overall the topic now is being taken more seriously than it used to be before on various levels thank you wow. thank you thank you yeah. so much how interesting this has been and i hope we can keep in touch and um see how, see how it progresses and thank you so much for giving me this opportunity to speak and to share my knowledge and um i very much hope to coming back and to develop further cooperation uh, with the city of Davis. <laughs>